Thank you so much uh, for keeping us company. Of course, the conversation begins uh, right now. Join us as we assess the state of mental health in our country. Did you know that nearly 3,000 people commit suicide daily? Yes, this is according to estimates by the World Health Organization. The global health body also says that out of every one person who commits a suicide or dies as a result of suicide, 20 or more of them are tempted to take their own lives. Suicide is a global problem. It is a big problem even here in, a, in our country, Kenya. A country that has recorded a surge in cases of depression. We've seen cases of homicide going up, intimate partner violence getting tragic. We have to talk. We have to know what is the root cause of what we are witnessing in our society. And that is why we are here at the Chiromo Hospital Group to talk to none other than a man who has been doing this for close to 40 years. He knows what it means to heal the minds of people. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Frank Njenga. Karibu sana. Asante sana. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for asking me to come. All right. Dr. Frank Njenga uh, is the chair of the National Mental Health Task, Task Force that was established uh, by the Ministry of Health in the year 2019. So we really want to understand what progress we have made as a country since the, establish the establishment of this particular task force. Let's begin there. First of all, what is the mandate of your task force? Okay. I think to, to understand this, uh, this whole concept uh, well, one needs to go back to 1st of June 2019, when in Narok, the president actually declared um, that mental health was becoming a very serious matter for consideration in this country. Uh, and on that day, Madaraka Day at Narok, he actually directed government in general um, to, to look into the matter. That same year, 2019, cabinet met and decided to form a task force, which I was asked to chair. We looked into the state of mental health, and in, on the 7th of July, 2020, in the middle of uh, Corona, we submitted the report to, to government, and we are now in the uh, process of implementing the recommendations of that task force. So it's been a progress. It's not uh, that, that government woke up one day and, and, and decided to do no, it. It's a process that started off with the declaration that um, depression in particular, suicide and intimate partner uh, violence were matters that re required um, the focus and attention of all of us um, as a country. So um, what did we find? Well. Um, exactly as had been predicted, we found a number of things. First, that um, there was a very heavy burden uh, placed on us Kenyans uh, by mental disorders. That's the first thing. The second thing that we found was that um, uh, we had placed very little by way of resources to deal with this humongous uh, burden uh, presented to us by mental disorders. And thirdly, uh, we found that um, this very unfortunate situation was being propagated by uh, stigma and discrimination. So in a nutshell, uh, government recognized there was a problem and government decided to do something about yeah, it. Yeah. Thank you for taking us back to that passionate uh, speech by the head of state which sort of like uh, brought this whole issue to the limelight for us to really address it as a country. But I'd like to also marry this with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Experts are saying um, this pandemic has actually increased or even made the situation worse. As an expert in this field, what do you say about the impact of COVID? Well, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that uh, COVID has, uh, has made a very, very bad and difficult situation worse. On the 15th of May 2020, uh, almost about a month or two after um, COVID-19 was declared a, a, a pandemic by the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization issued, uh, very shortly after that, a report that many of us ignored, which told us that behind this virus, will come a surge in mental disorders of a nature and proportion of which we have not seen before. Guess what? 
the World Health Organization was absolutely right. We are now in the middle, not just of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, mm. but in the middle of one of the biggest mental health crises the globe has seen uh, in all time. Mm. So yes, um, the, um, the, the, the crisis actually is number one, arising from the virus itself. Number two, uh, from the measures that we take to try and protect ourselves from the virus, the isolation, uh, the not visiting your mother and grandfather, the not going to church. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the way we cope with stressful situations is to talk to our mothers. Yeah, to socialize, to spend time together. We're told when somebody you love dies, don't touch them, don't go near to them. And when you're really distressed, you're told don't hug those you love because, I mean, it's, it's the opposite of everything I have taught uh, in the life of being a psychiatrist. So the things that keep you safe <laughs> are the ones that uh, make you fall ill mentally. That's where we are. Yeah, thank you for, oh, you know, helping us understand how COVID-19 connects to the surge in the number of mental health issues. Aside from COVID, what would you say, is there anything else you'd say justifies the, the, the rising trend in the mental health issues we're witnessing? Okay, um, so covid is the first one uh, but very closely associated with COVID is the social and financial consequences of it the number of people who have no jobs now the people for whom lives and livelihoods have become um, a, a big mess I mean anybody who, who works in the hospitality industry for example um, has uh, has suffered a kind of stress uh, joblessness and reduced incomes uh, all over the world so that's the first thing that has really uh, caused us a uh, serious problem and then of course there's a global recession that but also and this is an important point uh, in our in our case maybe not globally mm. we as Kenyans have um, become very aware of ourselves mm. and are reporting via, via the media more often and more frequently mm. you see prior to uh, June of last year, women in particular suffered only in silence. Families did not speak out about intimate partner uh, abuse. Um, people in the community were too sh sh ashamed or shy to speak about mental health issues. But I think in the last five years, uh, we have come out of our cocoon and can now address mental health you know, formally without fear or shame. We've been in this for decades. Yes, <laughs> decades, decades, yes. <laughs> and we commend what you do, Dr. Ari. If you compare the trends in the yesteryears and what is happening right now, there are concerns about the generation that we are raising right now with regards to their, the way they manage stress, their stress management mechanisms. What would you say? Is it the generation or these issues are just actually rising? Okay. First of all, uh, 41 years ago when I graduated and now, uh, can be compared very easily with uh, day and night they are as similar as day and night. They are completely, the 40 years that we've been around have seen a complete and total transformation of the way that we view and treat uh, mental health issues. I'll restrict myself to only one thing, which is um, the, the supposition that the youth have, um, have serious mental health issues are wrong completely wrong. Actually from where I sit the future of mental health in our country rests with our youth and I'll tell you why our youth are our reason to hope. Yes they have very many issues yes they have many challenges yes the problem of drug and substance abuse is big amongst them. Yes unemployment is very high amongst them but unlike their parents their parents they are free to talk about it they have no shame they have no stigma they have no inhibition and the number of youth that are going to government institutions or to their doctors or to their counselors or to their spiritual providers or to their aunties and uncles and saying auntie I can't sleep 
I am depressed, get me a mental health specialist is bigger than you know. So sorry to cut you short, but it's so it's not about them being a softer generation. They are not softer. They can't deal with stress. They are ahead of their parents. Their parents uh, go whispering. The youth so so what if I have depression? So what if I have an anxiety state? I mean, it's up to you to get me better. They Google and they see that normal people uh, are the ones who get depression and anxiety and mental disorders in general. They have no stigma uh, and they don't discriminate, which is also very important, against mental health. So contrary to what uh, many people think, I actually see an incredible silver lining resting on the shoulders of our youth. What did you then say about uh, the stigma that is there? Lo there was a time when if you mentioned mental health, they there's that negative connotation that, that comes with it. I don't know what you'd say around how that culture is changing. Two things have conspired, to our con conspired for our benefit. First, the number of old people is, is, is small <laughs> compared to the young people. So the carriers of this bug of uh, stigma and discrimination relative to the entire population is relatively small. So the number of uh, grandmothers uh, who talk about uh, you being um, bewitched um, or suffering mental illness because your uncle who on the day they got married did not give the goat that was supposed to have uh, to, I mean that kind of stuff the, the youth don't even understand that and when I graduated and that's why I say it's day and night the difference uh, people of this country understood mental disorders as arising from bewitching from goats that were not slaughtered I don't know looking up or looking east uh, now the youth the youth have the same information as their contemporaries in California or in Munich or in Tanzania or everything. So actually the world is now flat. The information available to our youth is exactly the same as that available in the rest of the world. And the, the level of stigma in relation to mental health is very low compared to their parents. Wow. I like your optimism and you know just telling us that um, the more information is out there, it's actually uh, very pivotal in addressing these issues. It's, it's about two weeks uh, before globally we can mark the World Suicide Prevention Day. This is a very serious issue, in this, having been in this. What do you think should be the main focus as we look forward to this particular day, having observed the trends in suicide and the, the gaps in addressing this issue, what should we be focusing on? Uh, three things. The first one is our terminology. All right? People commit crimes, they commit adultery, they die by suicide. So when a person dies by suicide, it's, it's a description of the fact that that person was so severely distressed and unwell mentally that they died as a consequence of an illness, not either of a moral depravity or a criminal act. So that's the first thing, terminology. People die by suicide. They don't commit suicide. They commit crimes and they commit adultery and other things. They die by suicide terminology. The second one is that we must remove attempted suicide from our statute books. Now if you are so depressed that you attempt uh, to do away with your life by killing yourself, if you survive then you go to jail. We need to change uh, the law quickly to make sure that those people who attempt suicide are taken a medical facility at once and not to jail so the second one is um, for me is changing legislation which will enable the conversation about and around um, attempted suicide uh, to the medical fraternity and the third thing is education and the first people to train have to be members of the media the fourth estate because you are the face of our society you are the ones who are there first you are the ones who report uh, on these events about suicide and who did what and there are very clear guidelines international guidelines from the World Health Organization on how to uh, report uh, on suicide and I have very very good news for you that um, in early September 
um, the Ministry of Health and the Office of the Presidential Advisor on Mental Health and Kenya Psychiatric Association have um, put together a workshop precisely to enable uh, the media report uh, properly uh, in a way that is helpful um, of society. And if I could say some one last thing uh, on, on the same area of education, the other group that we are targeting are the um, the spiritual providers, the faith-based organizations, whether they are Christian, Hindu, Muslim, and so on. Because unknown to you, most people who die by suicide will have gone to their spiritual provider, an imam, a pastor, in the week before, and told them, you know, Mr. Pastor, or Miss Pastor, I am feeling so distressed and distraught. I feel like I should do away with my life. Please pray for me. At that point, the imam or the, uh, or the, the pastor should say the following. Yes, Mr. Whatever your name is, I will pray for you. And we will pray that God heals you. And then they must pray. After that, the spiritual provider must say, having prayed to God, I will now make contact for you with a mental health specialist. Because the way to deal with these feelings of depression is to deal with the spiritual one, with God, and secondly and equally importantly, with your mental health expert. We work together. All right. No, 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 no. God, in his abundant wisdom, created not only the pastor, but also the doctors and the mental health specialists. So our cry to spiritual providers is don't limit God. Uh, God created both. And if he didn't want to have both people, mental health specialists and priests, he would have created only one. But now we have both and they must work together. I have more good news. More and more are working together in this Kenya. Wow. That's, that's really, uh, you know, something to look forward to because you're really concerned about how information is passed out there not just having information but how it's packaged how people receive it i want you to comment a little bit on how you would recommend uh, you know we go about it for example social media right now is a very big thing and people share photos of somebody who was found hanging on a tree or um, just the graphic photos of or people who've died because of uh, you know maybe intimate partner violence that has gone tragic do you feel this is actually helping in in, in elevating the seriousness of this yes problem? it is very sadly you see social media is a double-edged sword um, first of all, it's a genie that has come out of the bottle and you can't put it back. You can't stop social media be what it does uh, and you can't stop uh, social media uh, doing both good and doing bad. I think all we can say in a forum such as this one is that there will be instances where our brothers and sisters and children and parents will do certain things that are not desirable, like showing very graphic, uh, disturbing images of people who have died by suicide. And, you know, sadly, that, that's part of the enjoyment of the freedoms that we fought so hard um, to, to give. But you in the media, I as an elder, we have the responsibility to tell them, you know what, as you exercise your freedom, please remember um, that it, your, your enjoyment of the freedom can be harmful um, to an innocent uh, son or daughter or mother of somebody else. Um, so I don't, I will not go in the line of uh, uh, legislation mm -hmm. against uh, the social media because I mean we fought so hard to get these freedoms. But I think we need to constantly remind ourselves of the responsibilities we have even as we enjoy our freedoms. So sharing such graphic images is actually counterproductive. It's irresponsible. It is irresponsible. Uh, and, and I think some people share irresponsible material intentionally. Others share that sort of material without knowing the extent of the harm that they are doing. So I think our overriding responsibility is to address both groups. Those who want to do harm and those who do harm uh, without intending but out of ignorance. Mm -hmm. I started by sharing some estimates from the World Health Organization globally 
I want us to bring this closer home, put it in context. What are we working with in terms of the numbers? Um, and are they concerning from, yes, from where you yes, sit? Yes, yes. Um, there are recent numbers re released by the police um, mm -hmm. that surprised me. And, and, and I really, I am ashamed mm -hmm. that I was not fully um, aware of the extent of the of the problem the recent report by the police indicated that in the last in the preceding period of three months um, upwards of 400 people had died uh, of suicide if you look at a previous reporting period say 2019 which is the time that i i know the numbers well um, the number for the whole year was um, was less than 400 i think it was 375 meaning that uh, there is something that has happened mm. uh, during the, the the reporting period of three months mm. that has caused a sky record uh, skyrocketing mm. now before we all panic uh, um, there is there are two possibilities one mm. that indeed the rates of suicide have gone up um, exponentially and we must do something about it. Mm -hmm. But there is also the possibility mm -hmm. that we as a reporting uh, country have become better mm -hmm. at picking out what uh, events we record as suicide. Mm -hmm. So all, although both possibilities also exist, mm -hmm. that we are getting better at uh, identifying suicide mm -hmm. and also that the rates of suicide have gone up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, I think um, I'll, I'll say what I've said before. We have seen the fact they are disconcerting and we as government must do something about it. We can't, we can't look the other way. All right. So what is that, that thing that, that, that we ought to do as a country? Is there hope? They, I, I believe there is hope yeah. because by way of example, the, the government will be releasing uh, during the week of suicide prevention um, day um, a policy and a strategy on suicide prevention now this has not happened before so um, there will be issued by government yes um, for general distribution to the media to the, to the whole country um, a strategy the formulation of which is now complete I'm happy to report so that will be launched around the 10th uh, of September yes so <laughs> the fact that it's not out there with everybody seeing it is not to indicate that government is, uh, is sleeping and doing nothing it's, it's, it's to say government has recognized this is a serious problem and government is doing what it knows how to do which is to formulate both policy and strategy to deal with this humongous problem. Mm -hmm. We are looking forward to that uh, launch of that particular uh, report. But then I also want us to go beyond policy, beyond reports, and let's work with something that has been in existence for almost two years now, your task force. You traverse different parts of the country and you are trying to study. You, you, you studied the trends in mental health in the country. What did you find out? What were your recommendations? And years down the line, what is the progress in terms of implementation? A number of things. First, we said the big burden, and secondly, that we don't, we're not investing enough in mental health. Mm. So, um, with regard to uh, say the investment that we are, we have not been doing in in mental health. Mm. We found, for example, that um, as of that time, mm. Kenya was uh, spending 15 cents. 15 cents, 15 cents. It cannot buy you a sweet. Yes? 15 cents. Yes, 15 cents. Yeah. Come and do it for the mental welfare of the people. That shows you the, the value that we have put as a people of Kenya uh, on mental health. And that, that's what we found. Yes? So, what we are doing now um, is that we have put in place a formal process that um, is is um, is what is made called an investment case an investment case is a scenario whereby we uh, will be able to show the country that this 15 cents you are in, in, in investing is very bad if you invest an X amount if you invest for example a shilling in the mental health of Kenyans, what kind of return do you expect at the end of 5, 10, 
15 or 20 years. All right. I'm curious about two issues in those recommendations and plans, yeah? One is the issue of cost. Yes, we are limited in terms of the fiscal structures and the personnel. How does this translate in terms of the impact on the cost of accessing these services in case you're seeking? And also as you respond to that, also tell me, as you are traversing different parts of the countries, you must have noticed a difference in what County A needs and County B and County C. Is there something being done in terms of you know, coming up with context-based solutions, not a one-size-fits-all. Very interesting. Uh, we'll start with the, perhaps the least important one, uh, which is the, the Mathari Hospital. I've told you we are moving it to up the Gong Hills, but it's not just that that we are moving. We also intend to have six satellite uh, units to serve the different parts uh, of the country. So we will decentralize centers of excellence. Part of our big problem is that we, have, we don't have enough trained uh, people in mental health. So not only will the training take place in the main hospital, but in these six areas of excellence, there will be teaching and training and research uh, going on. So that is the, the, the list of them. Uh, because people do make criticism but at the same time uh, we recognize the importance of the community and the fact that really uh, mental health of, um, of a country um, is best uh, supported uh, from the community upwards. All right. So, uh, you know, what would you say about the cost aspect? Is there something that is being done to ensure that these services are available and affordable for every person who needs them? The investment case will help us a lot in telling us what, um, what returns do you get by making sure that boys and girls, men and women, who are able to access mental health care have by way of return. Now the tragic uh, finding, if you like, is that 90% of the people who need mental health services in our country do not get those services. 90%. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a very, very, very big number. In part, is because they themselves don't know they need those services. Yeah, that's even worse. Exactly. So you don't know you need the service. Mm. And even when you know you need that service, mm. when you go asking or looking for it, mm. the clinical officer that you find mm. or the doctor that you find in a queue in Moranga or in wherever, in mm. Kitutu, the church, they don't know that the, the, this Mugongo that you're complaining about and this Kumona Kichwa and this Tumbo are actually not physical conditions but signs of depression and that's why I tell you teaching and training the medical staff at the primary healthcare level at the level of uh, the community health workers is what will give us the biggest returns and is what will give the best uh, chances of access to mental health care uh, in our country does that mean we don't need psychiatrists does that mean we don't need psychologists not true we need them but we also need to push the conversation about mental health to the level of community health workers good you good proposal you wish it there i just like to take you to this intimate space the intimate partner violence you've seen you've seen what is happening in the news lately and even in this program what we have been talking about is domestic violence and the tragic ton of events that we have been reporting in our media what would you say about probably our capability of reading the red flags of reading the signs of the mental health issues are we are we are, are we aware of what we need to look out for because sometimes i feel like we tend to realize when it's it's already too late one person is already dead or a whole family has been burnt in a house i think part of think the part of many many, many issues many. around the intimate partner um, abuse is the fact that um, mm. until recently mm. it's not been talked about uh, openly um, and I think now, I mean, even in this conversation, and, and even when um, His Excellency the President spoke uh, on the 1st of June uh, two years ago, uh, we have raised the conversation to where it is now. And I think, um, and I think FIDA did an excellent study on this matter about 10 years ago, 
women used to feel ashamed or afraid uh, of speaking out and part of the reason for that uh, if I remember the FIDA report um, was twofold one was an it was financial or economic reason that the violence continued in the home because women in particular were blackmailed uh, your children will not go to school your children will not go get to hospital a, a financial challenge the second one which in my view part is more serious is that we as the parents of these young women uh, would tell them Jesus does not like divorce Jesus does not like which is true but he, he just doesn't like dead girls you know either you know and, and and I think what we are doing which is right is that we are encouraging um, potential um, survivors of uh, intimate partner uh, abuse to come out with dignity and say my mother told me, my father told me my pastor told me that there is a point beyond which uh, relationships can go and it is perfectly in order for me to ask for help when I feel that my physical uh, space has been violated. Mm, yeah. I think as we continue having such conversations and as the stigma fades away, more people will come out and actually seek these services. They'll be more self-aware that it gets to a point that I actually need help to address some of these mental health issues. I just want us to look at um, the solution part of it. What are some of the factors uh, that are considered before probably you recommend a clinical way of addressing it, for lack of a better term? You know, we live in a society where we don't allow the word continuum to exist. This is a continuum. And we start um, at the very nearest point where uh, girls and boys who are married recently should be encouraged to talk to each other about, you know, I, I, I'm not happy about the way we are getting on in this marriage. We don't talk to each other anymore. Uh, we don't um, plan our lives anymore. I don't feel respected. In just talking to each other. Basic, basic. Exactly. We, I, I think we should encourage that. Then at the next level of the same continuum is where a boy or girl should be able to go to to his or her uncle or aunt and say, you know, mom, auntie, I, I don't feel safe. I don't feel happy and I, I, I don't know what to do. And you will be surprised by the extent to which aunties are custodians of incredible uh, wisdom. You know, they will tell you, no, no. By the way, this happened to your cousin the other day, and I told your cousin, blah, 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 blah. You know, before you go to the level of formal structures uh, that would then include your church, that would involve now your sheikh, that would involve now the court system, um, before you involve even um, mental health experts, there is that, that continuum to which you must make yourself comfortable and available. By the time you come to us uh, as, as a psychiatrist, I'm not saying you should pass through all those ones. No, 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 because some situations are very serious. But each and every member of that continuum should have been brought into consideration. That's all I'm saying. It's a continuum. Not everybody has to be taken um, to big doctors. I don't want you. We've come to the end of this conversation and I just want you as part of your uh, part in short to talk to our society. You're addressing right now a society that sends a message of a hopelessness. Um, you know, COVID-19 has happened. People have lost their jobs. We are seeing the surge in number of domestic uh, violence cases. Today, you'd say hi to someone and they'll tell you, Napumua, Borau, hi, earth is hard. I'm sure you've heard these kind of phrases which have been normalized. We joke about them. But if you think about them deeply, it gives you a sense of a society that has sort of, there's a lot happening, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of hopelessness. What would be your words uh, of hope and encouragement to this society today? Just putting it in the context of the mental issues that we are dealing with. This crisis brought to us by COVID-19 has been very serious and has been like a huge cloud having all over us. This, I have to say though, it has a silver lining with respect to mental health. Let me explain. Today, this conversation that we are having is in my view part 
partly possible because the crisis before us has been so big that mental health issues are now properly and squarely on the table. His Excellency the President, upon uh, looking at the Mental Health Task Force report, uh, among other things, appointed his um, pres presidential advisor on mental health, which is myself. And my mandate includes talking to you and telling you that this government is committed completely to ensuring that mental health remains central to all that we as Kenyans do. Our mental health is secure in future. Thank you so much, Dr. Frank Njenga, for your time and for your words of wisdom and useful insights on how we are doing it as a country in terms of addressing mental health issues. We really appreciate your time. That's it for us. Thank you so much for watching. This is KBC Channel One. My name is Safin Achieng Oma.